Welcome everyone to the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. As you can see, we're still meeting virtually during this pandemic time with the COVID-19 virus, but it's our hope and prayer that uh, God will open up things that we'll be able to open the building up and uh, reconvene with our Wednesday night classes that occur right at this time, 7 p.m. on every Wednesday night, if the good Lord sees fit. So tonight we're going to uh, start a new topic, even though we're still studying the book of Luke. We're still in Luke chapter 22, but uh, we're going to start talking about Judas's betrayal and the Last Supper. Uh, I know that because of the details involved in teaching on the Last Supper that we won't get to all of that tonight. And so we may have to break this up over two or three nights. Um, I've been feeling really blessed in uh, studying this topic, even though I've studied these topics in the past over the last 20 years, probably more times than I can count. Um, every time I touch the Word of God, I learn something different. And so as we always talk about at Henry Street, we're going to take Bible study to an adult level. So we're going to go beyond just the surface level, the elementary things, uh, as the Bible would say, the rudimentary teaching on these things. We're going to dig deep. And of course, we're not just learning these things for academic reasons. We're learning them to increase our faith, increase our commitment, and just become better Christians as far as our obedience all around, that we're more and more like Christ at all times. So again, we encourage you to come by and visit us, but also continue to share with us at the Henry Street Church of Christ here virtually. Uh, we meet at 309 Henry Street in the city of Gadsden, Alabama, 35901 is our zip code, but you can also reach us at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com um, as well if you want to see some of the online things that we have and uh, go over to our YouTube video channel, all those type of things. Anything to help and promote the name of Christ in this earth and to show love unto you, uh, we make these resources available. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into our studies. Uh, again, we're going to start with Judas's betrayal. And of course, we know he was one of the original 12 apostles. We're going to look at him a little bit deeper than we typically do some portions of his life and um, why he was disapproved and why God was so displeased with Judas. Um, and it's not just the betrayal that he was uh, displeased with. There's other aspects of his character, as you like to say, that were just shady. In other words, underhanded even when he walked with Jesus. But nonetheless, let's not get ahead of ourselves and look at Luke chapter 22, verse 1 to verse number 6, which I'm going to read out of the King James Version of the Bible. And as always, I encourage you to read along with me on the screen or in your paper Bible, whichever you prefer. It's easier to digest and take in the Word of God when we read it ourselves. Let's look at it for a moment. Luke chapter 22, verse 1 to verse 6, and verse 1 and 2 are on your screen right now. And it says, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. So again, they're trying to kill Jesus. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 22, verse 3 and verse number 4. Again, we're going to stop at verse 6 and discuss it and then go on to other scriptures, the Lord wills. All right, verse 3 and verse 4 of Luke 22 says, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. And it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 5 and verse number 6, And they were glad and coveted it to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them, in the absence of the multitude. All right, let's look at this for a moment and look at it from a context portion that, because your context is going to make a big difference in understanding what the scriptures are trying to communicate to our hearts here today. All right, so one of the main things, going back to verse 1 of Luke chapter 22 that Jesus mentioned, he said, the feast of unleavened bread was near. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, let's get the history on that because it makes a difference. On the Jewish calendar, in the Bible, it was the 15th to the 21st of the month Abib. Now, that's the Jewish calendar, month of Abib. And we go by, in the United States here, what's called the Gregorian calendar. 
In other words, our everyday calendar. That would translate to about March or April of every year is that when that would actually occur. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was used to remember the hurry that the children of Israel had to use when they had to leave Egypt in the time of Moses. In other words, in the time of their deliverance, they had to be ready. And so they could not wait for any bread to bake. So that's why they didn't put yeast in it, which is leaven. Leaven is another name for yeast because you would have to wait on it. So they had to make bread without it in order to carry with them and eat, you know, along the way. In the other part of unleavened bread uh, ceremony, in the days of Jesus in the Old Testament days as well, all yeast had to be removed from the home, not just from the bread, but it couldn't even be in the home at all before the festival came and it could not be used in bread as you know. The other stipulation, the other regulation got put on them in those time frame was that they could not do any type of work except for preparing food. Now, again, the other part of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was that the Jewish people were to eat unleavened bread for seven days. You'll see that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15 to 20, which you can read on your own time. And again, all of this was done, the unleavened bread during the time of the Exodus, meaning Moses and the children of Israel being delivered from Egypt, was to make sure that they never forgot that God had delivered them from Egyptian slavery. So God wanted to make sure once a year that at least they would remember the deliverance, the power of God, the compassion of God shine upon them uh, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there was a reason for that being a Jewish holiday uh, in the time of Jesus Christ. Now let's continue on now. Again, you're understanding the context so you can understand what the scriptures are actually saying. So we're still in verse number one. And notice that God had called the entire thing Passover. Now, Passover technically started on the 14th day of Abib. Um, and again, that's the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So technically, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they overlap with each other. And that's why it was commonly called the Passover for the entire eight days. Okay? Okay. But technically, the Passover was on the 14th day of Abib, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread actually started on the 15th day of Abib. But for short, um, people called it all the Passover, okay? And of course, you'll see all of that in Leviticus 22, verse 5, which starts the Passover description in the Bible. All right, so we'll keep going on that. In the Passover, that day, the children of Israel were to eat a lamb with bitter herbs within that entire Passover meal. Now, this meal, again, was designed to remind them of God's power in delivering them from Egyptian slavery. So both events, the Passover proper as well as the Feast of Living Bread, always used to remind the children of Israel the power of God and the compassion that he put upon them in order to deliver them from Egyptian slavery. And again, on your own time, you can read Numbers 9, verse 1 to 14 to get a feel of this Passover uh, celebration. All right, hang with me a little bit longer because we're going somewhere with all this. All right, now we're in Luke chapter 22, verse number 2. And one of the profound things that Jesus said and one of the main points was, he said, and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. So again, they were in the mindset that they wanted to take Jesus off the planet. They wanted to take the breath of life from his lungs, start to stop this heartbeat of all that. In other words, they wanted to murder uh, the Lord. They wanted to kill him. So they were conspiring to kill Jesus at this point in Bible history. Now, remember, Jesus had done nothing wrong. He was innocent in everything. They had no reason to be that way. But remember, the scriptures identify us to us later on in Bible history what their true motivation was. Their true motivation was that they were jealous of the popularity that Jesus had over the Jewish people. So they wanted to get rid of him so they could always seize the power, the glory, all of the greetings, all the salutations, all those things from the people they wanted for themselves. So they didn't want Jesus to have that. So he was in their way 
And so they wanted to get rid of him so they could have the, what the Bible calls a preeminence instead of Jesus himself. So let's look at that really quickly here. You can keep it for your own reference, your own memory bank. But Matthew 27 verse 18 is after Luke chapter 22. And this is when Jesus was standing in front of the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, where the word of God reveals to us the true motivation behind the hatred, the bitterness, and the conspiracy to kill Jesus by his enemies. So I encourage you to turn there for a moment, but keep your bookmark at Luke chapter 22, because again, that's going to be our main emphasis today to keep studying Luke 22. But we're going to take this short detour to show you this motivation of Jesus' enemies, which is in Matthew 27, verse number 18. And again, I'm going to be reading when I read out of my paper Bible out of the King James Version of the Bible. And it says, now this is Pilate that God is talking about, the Roman governor. It says, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. In other words, he knew the reason that they had brought Jesus to be crucified was because they were jealous of him. So again, these in this specific uh, Luke chapter 22, the chief priests and the scribes, the Jewish leadership at the time, they could not stand to see Jesus prayed and followed, praised that is, and followed by the Jewish people. They couldn't stand to see people praise Jesus and follow him again because they wanted that for themselves. So they wanted to get rid of him in order to remain in control of the people. Now let's continue on. Now let's talk about the chief priests. Because again, this is part of your understanding, my understanding as well. Uh, the characters, their motivations, so you understand the scriptures themselves. Now, the chief priests, again, are mentioned in Luke chapter 22, verse number 2. Uh, their role was this. They were in charge of the worship at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem at the time when the temple stood. They were supposed to be experts in the interpretation of the scriptures. And I lose, use that word lightly, loosely, supposedly experts, because yes, they were well studied, but they did not interpret things correctly. And they added, you know, just like any of the rest of the Jews, they added their own traditions, their spins, their opinions upon these things that really took people and themselves away from God. But later on in Bible history, these same chief priests, after Luke chapter 22, they would give the formal and false accusations of Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, in an attempt to have the Lord executed. Remember the times the Roman government was in charge of the Jewish people and they had taken the death penalty away from the Jewish leadership. So the only way to have a man executed legally was to make sure that they, you took them to or him to the Roman governor in this case, present your case and have him crucified. And that's exactly what the chief priests are scheming to do, which unfortunately they would be uh, successful later on in that case. I'm talking about unfortunately in, in, in the sense of that they put an innocent man to his death, but fortunate for us, because we know that that was the plan of God for Jesus to die for our sins so that we don't have to answer for them on the judgment day. So again, the chief priests were some scandalous type of people. When you look at Matthew 27, verse number 20, you can do it on your own time. Um, they were instrumental. In other words, they were very successful in persuading the crowd to have Jesus executed instead of Barabbas, as they had the choice between Barabbas and Jesus, as Pilate gave them that choice later on in Bible history. And also in regards to the history of the chief priest, after the death, the burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven of the Lord Jesus, they unsuccessfully tried to stop the apostles uh, through imprisonment, threatenings, beatings, and intimidation to stop them from preaching salvation in Jesus. So obviously then, before the cross of Calvary, these chief priests were some scandalous, cold-hearted, rebellious, ungodly people. And they remained that way even after the death of Jesus Christ and trying to stop what they would consider his movement in converting people to Christianity for the salvation of their and my soul, your soul as well. All right, so let's continue on. Again, uh, the scribes are mentioned. If you remember from previous lessons, we talked about the scribes already, but let me quickly review so we're not off chart or we remember who they were. In Luke chapter 22, verse 2, they're also mentioned. 
Now, again, they, just like the chief priests, were the enemies of the Lord. They, too, were supposed to be experts in the Old Testament Bible, which was the Bible that was out at the time. Remember, the New Testament had not been written yet. It was not written until after Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, which were before that right now, Luke 22. Uh, the scribes also were the teachers of the Old Testament law of Moses to the people. And of course, as I mentioned, they were allies to the Pharisees, which means they were enemies of Jesus. Uh, again, their religious beliefs is that they believed in angels and they believed in the resurrection of the body, which was correct. Uh, but again, they had issues because they added the, the traditions of the elders to the teachings of God's word, which was sinful. Because again, as we studied on another occasion, we cannot add to or subtract from the word of God. We have to study the word of God, absorb it, believe it, obey it, and leave it alone. Not add one letter, not add one word, nor take away a letter or a word from it. Um, otherwise, we will suffer on the judgment day, and that will be eternally. But obviously, these scribes, these uh, Pharisees, these uh, chief priests, they weren't scared of that. And so they obviously did a whole lot of that. And unfortunately, they're going to meet their maker at the end of time, and that's not going to be pretty. When all is said and done, that's going to be a great time of suffering for them, for adding the traditions of the elders. The Bible itself isn't tampered with. I'm not saying that. But they also had the Talmud, which was an additional book, which was all their traditions that they put on the same level as the Bible itself. When in fact, the Talmud is nothing but a commentary passed down for generations that they made holy that really wasn't God's word. And so the scribes were guilty of that. And that book still exists to this very day. All right, let's continue on then. Going to Luke 22, verse number three. The Bible says, and Jesus uh, mentioned this as well. Uh, he said, then entered Satan into Judas. Now, remember, Judas was one of the original 12 apostles. And being one of the apostles, meaning he had all the rights and privilege of the apostleship. This means that just like the rest, the other 11 apostles, he had the privilege, the awesome ability to literally eat with Jesus. He literally was able to witness the miracles of Jesus as they unfolded in real time. He had the ability and he did, just like the rest of the apostles, preach unto the Jews, trying to get them to repent, meaning change from their sinful lifestyle to a godly lifestyle. Because as Jesus was saying, the kingdom of heaven was near or, or, or just about to come into existence and he had to prepare their hearts in order to enter it. So he had a part in that ministry. He had a part like the rest of the apostles to cast out demons and anything else the apostles did, he did too. God did not deny him uh, any of the rights and privileges, the powers, the miracles, any of those things of the other apostles. He was able to do all those things. Which again, you can go back and verify on your own time in Acts chapter number 1, verse 15 to verse number 26. But unfortunately, the problem with Judas was that his fatal flaw is what we, we like to call it. His spiritual issue was that he was money hungry as he would often steal from the treasury. Uh, and this is before uh, he sold Jesus out to the Jewish leadership. He was already, already stealing from the apostles and Jesus as he was a treasurer, but he was a dishonest treasurer. And not only was he doing these uh, ridiculous and evil things, but he became a traitor to the Lord for 30 pieces of silver, as you can see in Luke 22, verse 5, verse 6, and Matthew chapter 26, verse 14, to verse number 16. So his whole lifestyle was just foul, just was, was an ugly lifestyle spiritually, um, even when he walked with the Lord Jesus, literally. Remember, he had the problem of the love of money. And as the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 6, verse number 10, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's why Satan could enter his heart and why it was so easy for him to become the traitor uh, over all other apostles that are mentioned in the Bible. Let's look at that for a moment because 1 Timothy 6, verse number 10 is also directed at us to avoid. I know you're very familiar with it, but I want you emphasize this, of course, because it was part of Judas's character, unfortunately, and we can be the same way if we're not careful. Our right, first Timothy chapter six, verse number 10. Let me uh, turn there and I encourage you to turn there with me. And again, keep your bookmark 
at Luke chapter number 22 as well, as we're going to return there periodically and throughout uh, this message. Our right, first Timothy chapter six, verse number 10 reads as follows. For the love of money is the root of all evil, meaning it's the cause of it, which while some coveted after, in other words, some people chase it greedily. They have erred from the faith. That means they have walked away from their true faith in Jesus Christ because now money has become their God in so many words. They spend more time chasing money than praising the Lord and, and some more time chasing money than worship, reading their Bibles, um, you know, studying, uh, praying, all those type of things because why? Money has become their God and that becomes their main focus. God is saying, don't allow that to be your case. You know, don't allow that to be a part of your lifestyle because there's consequences for that. He says, again, let me reread re it. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and what have they done? It says, and pierced themselves through with many sorrow. So in other words, you find out at the end of the day, no matter how much money you accumulate in your bank account, that you can't take it with you. Um, you, you, many times, especially us as men, we neglect our wives. So we miss out on, you know, the joy and bliss of marriage. Uh, we miss out on our children growing up in front of our eyes and growing up too fast. And you can't redeem those times. All of those types of things, um, are part of the sorrows we inherit when money becomes our God. We're so focused on it that we forget everything else, God and family, uh, included, and we actually regret that at the end of the day. And so God is saying, don't put your mind that in that capacity, because that is you're going to pay for that in this life and the one to come. Now let's move back on to track and talk about Judas some more. Now what this is saying is is that Judas was not possessed by Satan literally. There's a reason why you got to understand that Satan just didn't take him over. And Satan can't take you over. He can only be let into your heart, okay? Because the Bible tells us that actually, uh, when you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 25, that Judas decided to follow Satan. That's what it means to have transgression. Transgression means you have yielded to, you have obeyed the temptations Satan put out there. Uh, for you, kind of like he put some bait out on a hook and you're going fishing and you bit the bait and he reeled you in. That's what it means to uh, let Satan in enter into your heart. It means that you are consenting to do his will, which is nothing but sin or also known as transgression. Let's look at Acts chapter one, verse 25. This shows us that all alone Judas had free will. He had the ability to tell Satan, no, I'm not going to sell Jesus out. And he had the ability to tell Satan, yes, I will. So he made that decision on his own. And when he made a decision to say, I'm going to betray Jesus, that's when Satan entered his heart and took over and became his God. Okay. All right. Let's get to Acts chapter one, verse 25. And I'll show this makes a difference because there's some false doctrine, some false that, that Judas was saved. There's no way in the world that Judas was saved because people what they're teaching today is once saved, always saved, meaning that you can live any type of way you want to and expect heaven to be your home. God says that that, that is not true. Man teaches that, but not God. This is why Jesus says that if any man follow me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. If any man be my disciple, let me say it correctly, let him pick up his cross uh, let him deny himself, that is, pick up his cross and follow me. In other words, it's talking about the true lifestyle that we have to live. We can't live any old type of way. We have to live in conformity to what Jesus teaches us. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 25. Let me get there really quickly here because I know time will get biased if I don't keep going here. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 25. Almost there. And we'll read it together, if you will. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 25, and, this is, and, and Judas is the subject of our conversation in Luke chapter 1, 25. It says that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by what? By transgression fell. 
that he might go to his own place. That's a very profound thing. Remember the context of Acts chapter 1 is that Judas had already died. He had already committed suicide because all the guilt he accumulated from betraying Jesus. So he went and hung himself. Now the church is down to 11 apostles, but God wanted 12. And so they're going through the procedure, if you will, of picking the 12th apostle, which means to replace Judas, who had already died at this point. But they told us what was wrong with Judas. It said that he fell by transgression. That means he chose to sin. And that's what made him fall in God's eyes. Okay. And then the Bible says that he might go to his own place. Well, that's easy to figure out what his own place was, because that means that the apostles were on their way to heaven. But Judas went to his own place, which means a different place than them. That means he was going to be hell bound. OK, so Judas is one of the first people, one of the few people in the Bible that God actually talks about going to hell. Uh, you rarely see God talk that way um, about people as an individual throughout the Bible. But Judas was marked and he's, he was marked for hell a long time ago because of the choice that he had made being covetous, meaning greedy for money and selling out Jesus. All right. So again, Judas had free will like everybody else. Again, he was not saved as some falsely teach today, because again, the Bible tells us he went to his own place, which means spiritually after he committed suicide, which is a reference to hell. He's also called, look at John chapter 17, verse number 12. I call this uh, Jesus' unity prayer. This was one of Jesus' last prayers before he uh, went to the cross of Calvary when he was talking to the Lord. And he was talking about uh, the apostles themselves. And he was saying that all of them are not lost, meaning that they are saved. The other 11 are saved except for one, which he called the son of perdition, which is Judas. Let's look at that for a moment. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse number 12. All right, let's turn over there. I want to read that as well uh, in your hearing. And of course, feel free to read along with me. Uh, John, chapter 17, verse 12, uh, reads as follows. And this is Jesus praying to the Father prior to him being crucified some days later. He says, while I was with them in the world, he's talking about the apostles. I kept them in thy name. Those that gave us me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. So again, he's saying none of the apostles are lost, except, look what the rest of the scripture says, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, he called Judas the son of perdition. What that literally means is this. In the original Greek language of the New Testament, it means the son of destruction. That means the person that belongs to destruction. That means a person going to hell, in other words, okay? So again, uh, there's no way that Jesus could be saved as people teach today because the Bible teaches directly that this is one of the few names in the Bible we can pull out that's saying is hell bound, okay? All right, so um, obviously then Judas is scared is one condemned by God. And Jesus made a profound statement about him also. As we transition on right after this, Matthew 26, verse 24, look what he said about Judas as well. So obviously Jesus had nothing good to say about Judas because he condemned him to hell in so many words. All right. Matthew 26, uh, verse 24. And this was Jesus talking about what was to happen, which it did get fulfilled in Judas betraying him. All right. Matthew 26, verse 24. Uh, says the following, the son of man, that's Jesus talking about himself. The son of man goeth as it is written of him. That means he's going to be crucified, but it be betrayed. But woe unto that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. Look what he said about Judas. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. That means he would have had no opportunity to go to hell. Okay. And so obviously then Jesus is saying some very profound things about the eternal destiny of Judas Iscariot. Okay. That's why we, we study the Bible for ourselves. You know, I don't know about you, but you know, often I don't know what it is, uh, but it seems like everybody has a barber that think he's a preacher 
And that's what happened when I was living back in Michigan, you know, 20 years ago. The guy used to try to preach while he was cutting my hair. He One of his profound things, I shouldn't say profound, but one of his uh, errors that he was making is probably a better way of saying is that he believed that Judas was saved. But again, the Bible definitely talks against that idea. All right, let's move on then in our studies. Now, let's move down to Luke chapter 22, verse 4 to verse number 6, we've, which we've already read. So let's lift the highlights out of that and what we are to learn from these scriptures. Now, here's what uh, Jesus says about Judas as our highlight. And it says, and he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains. Now, so what Jesus is saying is that at some point in Bible history prior to the crucifixion, uh, Judas Iscariot snuck away from Jesus and the other apostles to secretly meet with the chief priests and the captains. Now, this resulted in this group of people, the Jewish leadership, along with um, Judas Iscariot, uh, to become a spy and to set the Lord up to be captured by the Jewish leadership out of the sight of the people. In other words, they were trying to get him alone, away from the crowd so that they can arrest him and eventually take him to Pilate for crucifixion. Again, this was necessary because the Jewish leadership feared a riot if they arrested the Lord in the midst of a crowd of his own followers. So they wanted to sneakily do it, do it undercover. And as you know, later on in Bible history, they would be successful and they would go under the cover of night in the seclusion of the Garden of Gethsemane, which was away from all of the crowds that they figured would have rioted if they would have uh, laid hands, meaning arrested Jesus at that time. Okay. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 22, verse 4 to verse number 6. You got another character that's being introduced for our understanding, and they're called the captains. Now, the captains were the men who were the security figures for the Jewish temple. In other words, they kept law and order in the temple from a physical standpoint. I had to make it simple and call them the temple police. So they were the muscle of the temple, okay, to keep people in line from doing things that have been criminal or uh, unholy in any capacity there. They were the physical muscle, if you will, symbolically speaking, of the temple, you know, under the leadership of the Jewish leaders of the time, unfortunately, who were the enemies of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so that allows us to this point as we keep building up to the Lord's Supper, which I know we're going to tackle on the next occasion. But we have to understand all that was being done as far as the Passover feast itself before we can actually understand the Lord's Supper that came after the Passover feast. Even though it happened on the same night, the more you understand the Passover feast that Jesus and the apostles were sharing on uh, that same night that the Lord brought in the Lord's Supper, the more you'll understand the Lord's Supper. It'll make more sense to you, okay? So hopefully that makes sense to you. It didn't sound like a tongue twist or a riddle there. You'll see what, what I mean by that as we unfold the Word of God. All right, let's read it now uh, as we continue on down the chapter. Luke chapter 22, verse 7 and verse number 8 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Now, the Passover is the lamb. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. So again, they're talking about the Passover meal. So that's the lamb. All right. Verse uh, 9 and 10 of Luke 22. Verse 9 and 10 says, And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water, follow him into the house where he entereth in. All right, verse 11 to 13, and then we'll discuss these verses of Luke 22 says, And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall shew you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. All right. Let's look at this and break this down piece by piece. Jesus made the profound statement. 
Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. As mentioned, this was the day that the Passover lamb was slain and eaten. Again, as we talked about earlier, this was the 14th day of the Jewish month of Abib. And on the current Jewish calendar, it's called Nisan. So don't be confused by that. Abib and Nisan are the same, same thing on the Jewish calendar. You may even run into some uh, contemporary Bible translations that use the word Nisan instead of Abib as well, even though Abib is uh, from the King James Version. It's just know that it means the same time frame, same month on the Jewish calendar. Just Abib is the old word and Nisan is a more contemporary word uh, that's used today. Okay. All right. Let's move uh, down to Luke chapter 22, verse number eight. Now, again, Jesus gave the commandments to his apostles, go and prepare us the Passover. Again, he's talking about the lamb and the meal uh, in its entirety where they were to prepare. Again, remember the Old Testament was still in effect in Luke chapter 22, verse eight. And this is why the Passover was celebrated then, but is not celebrated now. Okay. Remember, the reason why we don't go out as Christians and kill a lamb and eat it is because we aren't under the Old Testament anymore. The Old Testament was replaced with the New Testament. As a word of God, we must obey until Jesus die, uh, until Jesus comes back. So we obeyed. The people of God had to obey the Old Testament, in other words, until Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. That's when the Old Testament was taken out. And God put in a New Testament that we have to obey. That's why you hear us all the time in the church say we practice New Testament Christianity because there is no Christianity in the Old Testament. The New Testament is the beginning of Christianity. And so, again, that's why you hear people say New Testament Christianity. All right, let me show you this. In Colossians 2, verse 14, Hebrews 12, 24. Again, this is talking about when Jesus died on the cross. God took away the Old Testament and put in the New Testament as his, in lack of a better word, covenant, also known as agreement that we must keep for our salvation, not the Old Testament. All right, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says, and let's go turn over there for a moment. And this must be taught because you can't mix the Old and New Testament together. The Old Testament is for our learning. We learn faith from it. But we learn salvation from the New Testament, okay? Maybe that'll make it easier for people to understand and digest, okay? All right, Colossians 2, verse 14. Let me get over there with you. And God talks about it very bluntly of bringing in the old, uh, New Testament and taking away the Old Testament. All right, Colossians 2, verse 14 uh, gives it away to us. And it reads, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. It's almost like saying erasing the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Ordinances means the rules, the law, which is another word for the Old Testament. Okay. And it says in verse 14, which was contrary to us. The Old Testament was contrary to us because it actually worked against us. Uh, it always convicted us of sin, but it had no way of saving us. In the Old Testament, salvation didn't come until the New Testament when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. And God says, and, and again in verse 14, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So God is looking at it this way. Uh, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, the Old Testament was nailed to the cross as well. And when Jesus died there, the Old Testament died there, you know, symbolically speaking. So we don't have to obey the Old Testament. We obey the New Testament, which was given to us by Jesus. You can see in Hebrews 12, 24, and that makes it even more clear. Hebrews 12, 24. Let's turn there really quickly to show you that we're under New Testament Christianity and not the Old Testament. If you want to be pleasing to God and see heaven, that is. All right, Hebrews 12, verse 24, and it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, that's another way of saying the New Testament, covenant and testament are the same thing. And to Jesus, the mediator means the giver, the one that took it from the Father and gave it to man. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Talking about the blood of Christ, how it saves us. It, it, it is used as God's agent to forgive us of our sins. Unlike Abel's blood that called for an eye for an eye, basically called for punishment 
upon Cain. That's the difference between Jesus' blood and Abel's blood being spilled, who was killed by his brother Cain. Okay, that's what that scripture is talking about. And now again, the other reason why we're not uh, taking a physical lamb today is that when Jesus was given as the world's Passover lamb, in other words, he was the last Passover lamb given and the only one that satisfied God when all is said and done. So when Jesus was given as the world's Passover lamb, when he died on the cross of Calvary, there was no longer a need to offer any other lambs like the Old Testament Jewish people did every year. Okay, let's look at that for a moment. And Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 talks about the completion or the finality of Jesus being God the Father's Passover lamb for us so that the wrath of God on the judgment day passes over all faithful Christians. In other words, the wrath would not touch us, but instead salvation and eternal life will be ours instead on the judgment day to come, which is the second coming. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 12. So let's turn over just a couple chapters and you'll see that for yourself. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says, But this man, and Jesus is our subject, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, notice what it says. When he died on the cross of Calvary, that was one sacrifice, and it was done for the sins of us forever. So no other lamb needs to be, be given because he is the lamb. He is the perfect lamb. He's the one that God the Father gave himself for our salvation. So that's talking about finality. No more offerings of lambs because the real lamb, Jesus, was given. Nearly 2,000 years ago. Let me read it one more time. Make sure we don't miss a part of it. He says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifices for sins forever, sat down. Remember, sat down means to go to rest. You know, he's no longer working. His work has already been done when he died on the cross of Calvary. Finality. Again, he sat down on the right hand of God. So he's in heaven right now, seated right next to the Father God until all his enemies be made his footstool, as we had talked about uh, in the past. Again, the finality of Jesus being our Passover lamb and the final Passover lamb is because Jesus' death was completely satisfactory to God the Father for the sins of all faithful Christians. And again, he only had to do it one time. That's why Jesus doesn't have to be crucified every year like lambs had to be killed every year in the Passover. Okay, all right, let's get 1 John, and that, that tells you about the finality of Jesus' sacrifice of himself. 1 John, near the end of the, um, the Bible, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, talks about that. All right, and in Jesus is our subject. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2, And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation is your key word there. It means a sacrifice that brings peace with God. Another word that you'll use that means the same thing as propitiation is atonement. He's the atoning sacrifice. He who brought peace between us and God for all those that are faithful Christians. Okay. All right. Let's continue to move on because this is getting deep. I understand that it is, but it's under, it's necessary for us to understand the Passover meal that he's, 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 he's engaging in with his uh, apostles and then the Lord's Supper later on after this Passover meal. All right, so now where we're at is still in Luke chapter 22, verse 9 to verse number 13. And Jesus, um, excuse me, not Jesus, but the apostles asked, where wilt thou that we prepare? In other words, what are we gonna, where are we going to go in order to stage this meal so that everybody can partake of it? Now, again, Peter and John were designated to prepare the Passover meal. Again, they were asking where they were to gather to eat it together. Now, Jesus gave them the instruction to follow a man carrying a pitcher of water into a home in the city of Jerusalem. From there, they were to inquire, they were to ask into where the guest room was so the Lord and his disciples could eat the meal there, okay? That's what the guest chamber is when the King James Version uses those words. Now, they were to be taken to an upper room in this, this house to be revealed to them where they could prepare the meal. Now, of course, we know Jesus is divine. He knows all things. 
And so he was foretelling the future when he told them these things, these commandments. So obviously then they have no choice but to come true because he is divine. So all the events that Jesus talked about happened as he said, and the apostles prepared the meal as they were instructed. So again, this is not just some random thing that God is recording in the Bible. This is talking about the divine nature of Jesus, showing you another miraculous aspect of Jesus, which means he had miraculous knowledge as well. Otherwise, he would not have been able to foretell the future and be able to tell the apostles what to do to make these things happen in the future. So how else would he have known the exact person the disciples would have to talk to in Jerusalem and that same person would lead them to another person whose heart was open to helping them get to that upper room. All of this is divine things uh, that Jesus was able to do, showing that he is the son of God. Okay, So it's, again, it's another demonstration of his power. If he can do something like this, I know he has the power to save us and do whatever he promises in the Bible. So this is just another indication of Jesus is who he is, the son of God, the Lord and Savior. Okay. Let's move on as time is getting away from us. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 22, verse 14 and 16. Let's read this for a moment. It says, and when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, these words, Luke chapter 22. Verse 14 and 16, these are introductory words before the Lord's Supper is actually instituted. In other words, right now, the Lord's Supper does still does not exist because Jesus has not commanded it yet. Okay. All right. Let's look at this for a moment because this is profound. This key to understanding the Lord's Supper, even though he's not talking about the Lord's Supper yet. Now, look what he says in Luke chapter 22, verse 14 and 16. Remember, they're celebrating the Passover feast right now. They're not into the Lord's Supper yet, okay? He said, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. In other words, he's saying this, this is the last Passover meal I'm going to have with you before basically he's going to suffer and literally die. That's implying dying for us on the cross of Calvary. So again, we're before the cross. Now, what this is saying, Luke chapter 22, verse 14 and 16, it was now time to eat the Passover lamb. And what Jesus was saying is, is that he strongly desired to eat this Passover with the disciples, also known as the apostles, before he was to suffer for our sins soon thereafter. He would have been craving their fellowship, as we all should. Remember, the church is to always engage in fellowship with other Christians. You'll see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Even Jesus engaged in fellowship, meaning spending time with other Christians, uh, so we can encourage each other, so we can have true friendship, so we can keep each other on track, you know, spiritually, so we can, you know, just do everything that a true bond uh, can be formed between all of us as God wants. Remember, God wants the church to become a community, a family of God's children, and you cannot do that if you never engage other Christians, which is called fellowship, form those bonds with them. And you you can see on your own time, Acts 2, verse 42, where the Bible shows us by example that the first century church stayed steadfastly in the King James Version. That means they would never let their fellowship be broken. They wouldn't let their, their doctrine be corrupted, their teachings be corrupted. They, they did everything together. And that's what God wants us to be close, you know, uh, and just, just inseparable is probably the best way to say it. So please, if you're not uh, really fellowshipping with others, if you don't have friends in the church, you got to reach out and make yourself available because these are the friendship and the bonds that God wants us to have. Even Jesus demonstrated that as he strongly desired to eat the Passover with his disciples. This is one of the last times on earth that he would get the chance to spend time with them. So he strongly desired to partake of this meal with them. So again, it's Christ-like for us to enjoy each other's time and our company. So if we're so eager to get away from other Christians or we just don't want to spend time with us, we got to check our spirit 
and make sure we're Christ-like because we're definitely not imitating the compassion and the love and the friendship Christ did with uh, those that will become the church later on in Bible history, okay? As an example to us. All right, Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 16. Now, this is deep. And as long as I've studied these verses, I really didn't realize what God was saying till today on this. This is how deep this hit me um, as I studied even deeper today, even after decades of studying. Now, look at Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to verse number 16. And it's kind of like we say here in the U.S., I had an aha moment um, today when I was studying this. Jesus said, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What Jesus was doing, now remember the Lord's Supper had not been commanded yet. He's previewing what the Lord's Supper would be like after his death, his burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord into heaven later in Bible history, which the church observes every first day of the week. See, basically what he's saying is, is that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are eating of the spiritual lamb. Okay, remember? Jesus is our Passover lamb. And so when we take up the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, in other words, every Sunday in the Lord's church, we're partaking of the spiritual Passover lamb is the way God looks at it. And that spiritual Passover lamb is Jesus. And so there will be no more need after the establishment of the church, which came after Luke chapter 22, um, for us to eat a literal Passover lamb because the Passover lamb was Jesus himself. As we mentioned earlier, he was the last offering, the last Passover lamb, the finality of the whole thing. And so when we eat of the Lord's Supper, which is the bread, we call it, we are, we are, we are symbolically eating of the Passover lamb, which is Jesus Christ. Again, you can see that in 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 7. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our Passover lamb for the church. That means you and I today. Okay. All right. Now let's look at Luke chapter 22, verse number 17. This was profound. Um, and it reads, and he took the cup. Now this is Jesus taking the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. All right, so he won't drink of it. Now, remember, he's referencing the Lord's Supper. Actually, not in this case. Let me, let me get it right. In this case, the cup that he's talking about here is actually the uh, not the cup of the Lord's Supper. Let me get it right. It's actually the Passover cup. So remember this. What are Jesus and his apostles doing right now? They're eating of the literal Passover lamb that was given every year. And they're drinking of the literal cup, which was the fruit of the vine, the, wine, the diluted wine of the time that belongs specifically to the Jews Passover meal. OK, so again, the cup mentioned in Luke twenty two seventeen 17 is not the Lord's Supper yet. That's not going to come to Luke chapter 22, verse number 20, where he's referencing a different cup. And again, this was an aha moment for me that I never realized that there's two cups being mentioned in Luke chapter 22, verse number 17. And they're mentioned separately for a reason. This is where it's going to get real deep and profound. And we're going to end right here. So again, and he took the cup and gave thanks in Luke 22, verse number 17. Again, this is still part of the Passover meal, the literal meal of that time. Again, it's not a part of the Lord's Supper. This cup was to be taken and given to all the apostles. And they would take the cup and they would pour the wine out of it, the fruit of the vine, into their own cups as part of the Passover meal they were eating at the time. So, but like the literal Passover lamb would be eaten in the church today, the fruit of the vine in the Passover cup would no longer be necessary as a new cup representing Jesus' blood would be used instead. In other words, both, think about now what I'm talking about. They're doing the literal Passover celebration, which involved a literal lamb 
in a literal cup. Now, within that literal cup then that they were drinking out of at that time that they poured into their own, that symbolized the blood of the lamb. So what they're doing literally right at that moment in the Passover meal, not the Lord's Supper, they're eating of the flesh of the Passover lamb and they're drinking symbolically of the blood of the Passover lamb, literally. Okay. And so now what you're going to see is that now Jesus is going to take of his last Passover because it would be the last Passover from a physical standpoint that the Jews would take as a religious thing for God. Okay, I hope you understand that now. So what God, Jesus was doing when he ate, uh, when he partook of that last Passover lamb and that last cup within that literal Passover meal that all the Jews had to do, he was putting away that ceremony for the final time. Okay, I hope that makes sense to you. Why would he put away the literal Passover eating of a literal lamb and drinking of the cup which symbolized a lamb's blood? Because he was going to celebrate it in a different way. He was about to institute the Lord's Supper, which was superior. The spiritual ceremony that we do today is superior to the physical ceremony that the Jews were doing at the time. Because think about it this way, the literal lamb and the cup they were drinking that the Jews were doing at the time, including Jesus and the uh, apostles of prior to the crucifixion, what they were celebrating was God's deliverance of them from Egyptian slavery and giving them the promised land of Canaan. All that stuff was temporal. It was to pass away one day. But what Jesus was doing now when he came into giving us the Lord's Supper, which we'll study on the next occasion, he's allowing us to symbolically eat of himself, him being the Passover lamb, and drink of his blood symbolically in the Lord's Supper, which gives us eternal life and gives us heaven as our home, which is superior to the land of Canaan that the Jews received. Oh, I hope you understand that. So obviously then you have to understand all these events that's leading up to the Lord's Supper because they make you understand the value of the Lord's Supper and they make you understand the symbols that Jesus is using in the Lord's Supper, okay? So obviously then on next occasion, we're gonna talk about the cup we drink of today and the bread we eat today, which is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ symbolically which is superior to everything Jesus and the apostles were doing in Luke chapter 22, leading up to the Lord's Supper. So hopefully this has been of value unto you and that you'll be able to share this information with someone else. So again, I welcome you back to the um, Bible study on next Wednesday at 7 p.m. once again. Uh, we'll broadcast it once again virtually. And we'll literally go over the details of the Lord's Supper itself as we're supposed to take it every Sunday, which is the first day of the week. And now you're understanding why it's so important as we lead up to our real study of the Lord's Supper on the next occasion. And so again, we encourage you to come out and visit us at 309 Henry Street um, uh, when the pandemic lifts and we'll be glad to embrace you and See you in the city of Gadsden, Alabama, and show you love from a Christian perspective and uh, partake of the Lord's word with each other and be joyful in the same. May God bless you. Keep us in your prayers and we'll pray for you as well. God bless you and we'll talk to you on the next occasion if the good Lord sees fit. Have a good night. Bye-bye.